uh, welcome everyone to the race online uh, seminars uh, for 2021. Uh, today, uh, Deba will, is going to present uh, deep time ensembles, well calibrated neural networks for human activity recognition. Deba, you can start. Thank you. All right. Thank you for, uh, for like, allowing me to present in the seminar. So generally, uh, this is my research as of now. And um, I will present to you uh, what I have done so far, the results and uh, the motivation methods and everything. And uh, generally, I would also expect you to comment on uh, whether the material would be like, you know, whether what caveats do you see and how can I make it better? Because I'm planning to publish it like, you know, soon, I guess. So uh, your feedbacks would be of great importance. And with that, I would uh, like, you know, start the presentation. Um, the, initially, I would like motivate the problem about why we need such a method that we have devised. Then I will uh, talk about a little background about some of the concepts which are not very difficult to understand uh, how we are going to evaluate and how we are going to see our method through. And then comes the actual method. Um, I will discuss it in parts and in, in a little detail so as uh, it's like, you know, very clear to everyone. And finally, I will present the results I have been got so far and uh, what other experiments I additionally plan to add on top of that. And then we can uh, think about some future directions, uh, research directions and discuss on that. So uh, the motivation of the problem, oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, this is composed of two main parts. One is human activity recognition and the second part is confidence calibration. Today actually I presented uh, a much detailed seminar on con confidence calibration in KTH. So uh, some of my colleagues already are aware of that, but I guess. Uh, I'll, I'll just skim through that part here so as to not complicate it further, but still have enough understanding to like understand what, what is the method. Uh, so I'm defining like human activity recognition process. Uh, as many of you already are aware of it, it because you have probably worked with it or you have seen a seminar like where I presented the same like concept. So in general, I'm working with data which are coming out of wearable senses. So you have like smartphones, watches, belts or whatever not. And based on the census data, you are generating constant time series, which are which can be accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, heartbeat, or other forms of recordings that are like you know flowing in a temporal manner. And based on this data, we usually have two ways we can do about it. We can extract features manually out of this uh, time series data and use some machine learning model like logistic regression SVM to classify our activities, or we can go about with deep learning model where we can skip the feature extraction part, manual feature extraction part, because deep learning models are known for automatically extracting those features. And based on those features, we again classify our activities. And so at a particular instance of time, when you feed in the data, you classify at that instance of time what the user was doing. It can be running, walking, and a range of different activities, which varies across different data sets. Now, representing classification, sorry, I, I just want to understand where I should I put my, like, you know, I can minimize this one. Yeah, that's better. Um, so if you, if like the last part, like last slide was mainly describing about what, how we can visualize the classification problem of human activity recognition uh, in terms of an overview manner. Now I will quickly mathematically like represent, mathematically a point estimate of a classification can be represented as P of theta Y given X but theta are the parameters of the model, which can be a machine learning or a deep learning best model. For rest of the slides, I will generally consider deep learning model. And why is the estimate or what the prediction that you like output from your model and X is a set of features. So as for, for our last diagram, this, these features that we calculate here automatically or manually are the X values in the next mathematical formulation. And this activity is essentially at the Y values of the mathematical formulation. And Theta is the representative of the models that falls in between. Uh, so yeah, that's what I exactly said. Now, argmax of Y gives us like, you know, the true prediction because uh, we usually from a deep, deep learning model, we get a probabilistic distribution of the classes. And when we do the argmax of the probabilistic distribution, we get the true prediction so that uh, the maximum confidence estimate that is given by the probabilistic distribution gives us or points us towards the right class. And most current deep learning and machine learning applications that are there in the literature follow that formulation because it's simple and uh, easy to understand. 
And the goal of all those methods are to classify the examples as correctly as possible or as accurately as possible. And you know, like, you know, said in a simple manner, you just boost your classification matrix so that you get better at classifying those activities that we, uh, that we have seen before. But what there are certain problems with this uh, like you know, approach when you are using neural network. So neural networks, which are explicitly trained to improve upon the accuracy, are often miscalibrated at their output probabilistic, probabilistic estimate. So if you remember from the last slide, I, I told you that Y essentially that is outputted by the neural network is a probability distribution of the classes that can occur in your activity or uh, like classes that can occur. And whatever like the most most of the neural networks by nature uh, if they're like you know uh, not not post processed or something they they provide us with miscalibrated probability estimate that means the classes that we are seeing are not representative of the true probability that you should ideally have from the neural network and uh, usually this is manifested in terms by pro like you know pushing the correct class towards a very high probability value, even though it does not deserve so. Uh, just consider a simple example. Maybe you are uh, going out running and uh, when you are running all of a sudden, you, you feel like, you know, you have to slow down and you still run, but you like, you know, run, run a little bit much, much less slower than uh, like, you know, than, than you were doing before. So in this particular case, the neural network, if you use a neural network to classify that, then it would always, along all this like you know timeline that you are running fast and running slow it will classify you as running but with a very high confidence of say 0 0.9 or 0 0.95 let's say your neural network is well trained the problem here is when you are running very fast when you are actually running an estimation of 0 0.9 or 0 0.95 is a very good estimate but when probably you slowed down certain thing changed in your body and certain like you know features changed inside the neural network that should have ideally pushed the neural network towards predicting this running activity with not 0.9, but rather let's say 0 0.7, 0 0.6, or some other sort of confidence estimate. But generally the neural network does not do so. And that's why they are like miscalibrated and they are they may not represent the true action and they are prone to producing overconfident wrong estimates. And hence, when we integrate those in practical applications, they suffer from something which is called like reliability. Uh, that your neural network does not model the true probabilities. Instead, they model something which is a bit overconfident than your true estimate. And for certain applications, uh, like, you know, safety related applications, it can be like hazardous in general. But, but like, if we can calibrate the neural networks, irrespective of the fact whether they are like integrated in a safety critical application or not, like, you know, easily, then why not? Like this can be a very, uh, uh, this can improve the reliability of using neural network across all the operations. Oops, what okay. Yeah. Hence the, uh, the calibration, uh, like, you know, uh, this, calibration, this calibration problems with the neural network were discussed initially when the neural network was in the inception stage and it was discussed until like 2002, I would say, but then it took a back seat because we saw after 2010, a lot of data and a lot of very nice neural network architectures, which were classifying the examples, like, you know, great. And they were doing very uh, like nice with their predictive scores and everything. And hence the calibration problem was not discussed like, you know, uh, much, but until recently, uh, they are very much explored in the context of computer vision NLP, NLP and many researchers have already talked about uh, deploying well calibrated neural networks by either deploying some calibration mechanism after the neural network is trained or as the neural network is trained, they are con constantly improving the calibration score of the neural network. But most of them are explored in the context of computer vision or NLP. And this is relatively underexplored in the context of human activity recognition. Uh, like or time series data actually like in perspective of time series data it is relatively underexplored and in human activity recognition to the best of knowledge, my knowledge it has not been integrated or talked about yet even though there are some methods which can probably calibrate but no one has explicitly explicitly uh, like you know focused on the goal of showing us that these networks are calibrated so it is totally underexplored in human activity recognition and hence the goal uh, of this like you know research was to classify human activities as accurately as possible, as well as being reliable uh, in terms of calibrating our neural network so that we can integrate it in uh, some practical applications much more seamlessly. Hence, uh, just to boil down, 
we want to produce high classification accuracy, F1 score, which is standard classification matrix, as well as we want to produce well calibrated probability outputs for certain predicted examples, not certain, but all the predicted examples of the neural network. So uh, just to quickly uh, go through certain backgrounds, which is essential to understand what, uh, like, you know, when we say when a neural network is well calibrated, what exactly we mean by that. So uh, in that perspective, we discuss uh, firstly confidence estimate. So this is the standard neural network formulation we, that I've already shown. And as you know, this in a neural network, usually the last layer is composed of a, a, a probabilistic, like in a normalizing function, which is called softmax. The softmax transforms the unnormalized estimate that is provided by the last layer of neural network into some normalized probability, which is called y. And this, this y is, and this y is essentially the same thing. And this uh, normalized probability help us to understand uh, which class, the class assignments and the, the possibility of uh, saying like, if for example, if you classify running, walking and uh, jogging as 0 0.7, 0 0.15 and 0.15, and this is the output of your neural network, then I must be able to say certainly that like, you know, I am running with a confidence as running with a confidence of 0.7, I'm jogging with a confidence of 0.15 and I'm probably walking with a confidence of 0.15. So, this is an essentially points towards like, you know, the confidence of the model in predicting these individual classes. And hence it is quite central to calibrate this softmax score. And as you can know, the classification level can be easily uh, like, you know, we can easily calculate it from the argmax of the softmax function. And this has already been discussed earlier. How can we estimate what is the confidence or what, what, what we say as confidence is the maximum score of y that can we can uh, that 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 we find from the probability estimate and from the example that i said earlier if you are running with a probability of 0.7 if you are jogging with a probability of 0.15 and walking with a probability of 0.15 then the confidence of this neural network is 0.7 which is the maximum of the probability distribution and hence this two together the classification level and the confidence uh, kind of quantifies what your neural network outputs so you are running is the answer to your classification problem and with what confidence you are running that's 0.7 so that's the answer to your confidence uh, estimate if i say in an ideal case that i have 100 predictions and each of them have point each of them has a confidence of 0.8 then overall i want my neural network to classify 80 of the predictions correctly so that there is a balance between the confidence that i predict and the uh, output that I, and the accuracy that I output. So you can think of it like confidence is a promise of my neural network that I promise that uh, I will classify, let's say 80% of the examples correctly. And accuracy should be analogous to that confidence. And it, the neural network should satisfy the promise of the confidence in terms of the accuracy. Uh, let's just uh, quickly explain uh, this diagram, then it will be much more clearer. This is a diagram, uh, this is a five layer, like, you know, Lenet architecture, and this is a 110 layer ResNet architecture. So as you can see, this was from 98 and this one from 2016. As we can see the classification error from this model, uh, which is 98 was 45%, and the classification error is 30.6% here. And as we can understand that, then this ResNet model classifies much better as compared to the Lenet model. But then we see the promise and the accuracy of this LANET model. We see the LANET model promised me a confidence of 0.45, and it serves the purpose by also providing an accuracy of 0.45, around 0.5. However, the LANET model promised me that I will give you an accuracy of like, you know, 0.85, like that's the average confidence because they give me a promise that I will classify 85% of the examples correctly. But instead in the accuracy, it provided us with a 65% accuracy. So there is a gap between the average confidence and the accuracy. And this is the gap that represents the miscalibration. This is the miscalibration that we are trying to like address. All we want to achieve this accuracy, like, you know, of like, sorry, this test error of 30.6%, which is better than this one. But we also want to have the confidence estimate and the accuracy close line together as this diagram. In the bottom part of the diagram, what is shown is that they have divided the confidence of from zero to one into multiple bins of equal width of 0.1. And here they show that in each of these bins, whatever examples fall, 
they exhibit a much lesser gap between confidence and accuracy in the Lenet model, but here they exhibit a much higher gap between confidence and accuracy in each of the, like in, in the ResNet model. And essentially we want to calibrate the difference, uh, like we want to minimize the difference between the accuracy and the confidence in each of the beams to be perfectly calibrated. And the perfect calibration can be represented by this gray dotted line, which is like a diagonal between the, in the square, in the square here. So we want to cap, so this, this, is, this is sort of a visual representation of what's happening, uh, but this visual representation is very nice in explaining uh, the concept, but we want to capture the, this, this reliability index into a number. And to do that, what we again, like, you know, rely on is this uh, bins. We bin the confidence space into equal, equally spaced bins. And then we calculate the average confidence and average accuracy across all those bins. So I'll just go back to the previous diagram quickly to explain what does that mean. And so essentially imagine you have a neural network and your neural network outputs certain values. So based on those values, you put them based on the confidence values of those output. If you remember, it was a max of the probability distribution. You put them in each of the bins. And then in each of the bins, you calculate the average confidence, you calculate the average accuracy. So for example, in this particular bin, the average, uh, average confidence is, uh, I, I don't know, like maybe something around uh, 0.8 or something. And the average accuracy is uh, much, sorry, the average confidence, uh, and I, it's, not, it's not evident from this diagram, what is the average confidence and the average accuracy of the bin. But for all the examples that fall in the bin, you can calculate the bin-wise average confidence and the bin-wise average accuracy. And that's what is uh, shown here. So for the bin BM, you calculate the accuracy of the samples. In the bin BM, you calculate the average confidence of the samples in the bin BM. Based on that, you calculate two metric, which is called expected calibration error. Using the accuracy of each bin and the confidence of each bin, you weight all the samples according to the, like, you know, across all the bins, which is called the expected calibration error because there's an expectation or an average. And there is something which is called maximum calibration error. And this quantifies the maximum difference that can exist uh, in any of the bin. So just going back again, here, the expected calibration error, uh, like, you know, is, is not, cannot be visually understood, but the maximum calibration error probably is this one, where there is the maximum gap between the accuracy and the confidence. So, so that's, the, that's the notion. And that's what, these are the two numbers that we want to uh, capture and quantify. And this will represent the reliability of our neural network. Uh, apart from that, a log likelihood is something that is also popularly used as a matrix, which helps us to understand the reliability or the calibration of a neural network. And also there is something which is called Breer score. I have not mentioned here, but that's essentially the squared difference that is also used to uh, capture the essence of uh, reliability and the calibration. Now, uh, with this background, I would like to drop into our method and we want to discuss some observations first that would lead us like, you know, that would, that would motivate why I have devised this method. And one, then I will uh, discuss the method in details and finally present an overview. So what are the observations? So if you remember the goals, we want to produce high classification accuracy in human activity recognition. We want to produce well calibrated probability estimates from the neural network. And what are the observations that I've observed? Um, the first one is, if we ensemble any neural network or machine learning architecture, it improves the overall classification accuracy. And why it does so? Because uh, by natural theory of ensembling, if you have a couple of good models on an ensemble that prediction, you reduce the variance of the predictive output that can come from individual models. So individual, since neural networks are stochastic models, it is uh, like, you know, and we can, we can try to reduce the stochasticity to some extent, but it can happen that the same neural network produces different output each time you uh, like, you know, test it with certain like parameters because it, 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 it has like initialization dependencies and other like, you know, uh, dependencies that, that can occur. So essentially each time you train the same architecture, you can get a different prediction and that prediction can, those predictions can provide you with high variances. And the, the problem of this high variance is essentially reflected in classification accuracy given by individual models. If we ensemble multiple models together, 
uh, multiple good models together, then there is a chance that you will reduce the variance of the predictive output given by an individual stochastic model sufficiently. And that helps you uh, boosting the overall classification uh, like score. This is like, you know, not, not new. I think it came in 95 uh, and it was first presented in the Bishop's book from Neural Network. It, was, it is also shown in one of the paper, which I uh, like, you know, presented in the morning. I will not go through that, that variance is inverse variance is inversely related to the confidence and accuracy. I should have like said like per, instead of prediction, it should have been confidence. So if you have more variance, then you have less accuracy. That is a general theory which is also presented for in the Bishop's book. And if you have more variance, you have less confidence as well. So both of these are inversely related to each other. And hence we have decided to choose ensemble as a modeling strategy. Uh, when we will, when we try to estimate high classification in human activity recognition, as well as well calibrated estimates. There is another observation which, uh, like, you know, helps, uh, helps, helps us to construct the, uh, the algorithm that we are uh, going to show. As we know, in human activity recognition problem for sensor data, or for that matter, any time series classification problem, we have to select a correct window size. And the selection of this correct window size is a very important procedure. And Generally, uh, for the past papers for human activity recognition, I have seen like they are usually chosen by like selected empirically using some ablation studies or they are sometimes like there is some adaptive sampling strategies that helps us to select the right window size. And for some of the paper, they show that a right window size of let's say 100 is very nice. For some of the paper, they have like the consideration that a window size of 50 is very nice. And but they, they may result in the same accuracy but with a different window size, probably because they have different architectures or whatnot. So essentially this window size consideration is quite important for human activity recognition task with uh, our time series classification task. And based on these two observations, that is the importance of window size and the importance of ensembles, we present our method, which is called deep time ensembles. Here, what we try to do is we try to combine this windowing like scheme and uh, like ensembles together to boost classification accuracy and improve calibration. Uh, assume that you have a time series data that is uh, represented by this diagram. And this time series data gives you the following like representation. So this is, let's say, this is just some acceleration score, A1, A2, A3, which is like varying across time. And there is a corresponding level that is associated with this uh, acceleration point. So for example, maybe L1 represents that you are running. So. You, you are running, when you are running at a particular instance of time, you are generating an acceleration A1, you are generating acceleration A2, you are generating acceleration A3 and so on. And as you continue to like, you know, pass through different activities, the acceleration stream evolves as well as the level stream evolves. And now this is a standard time series data that usually uh, comes through variable sensors. So what we do for processing this is we select the instance of time, which is called T. And then we select an overlapping size, which is again, like depends on your, uh, like, you know, choice. And based on these two parameters, we vary, like, you know, our, 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 our selection window. So here we have T, we have an overlap. Then again, we slide by this overlap, select another window T, and we continue this procedure until we reach the end of our data set. <clears throat> so this gives us a matrix which is given as follows. So for the, for example, for the first T window, we have A1, A2, A3. Then we had overlap of one here. So the next window is again of size three, which is A2, A3, A4. Similarly, we continue this till we reach the A and, and we also select the labels. Uh, usually by frequency, we can also like, you know, have other labeling schemes. So here for exa this example, since the most occurring label is L1 in the first window, we select the label as L1. Maybe in the second window also, it would be L1 because we have the maximum frequency of L1 in the second uh, like, you know, row of the data. Similarly, we select the labels accordingly. And this gives us our classification matrix if you think of it in terms of a machine learning or a deep learning problem. So this is our feature set and this is our label set. And we generally feed this to a single model and we get our classification scores. And uh, except the, the model hyperparameters, the hyperparameter to the process is the window size and the interval that we choose. And uh, what we want to propose is we want to have, and since this 
windowing scheme, the choice of the window size is quite important for time series classification problem. We want to have the flexibility of choosing multiple window size and multiple overlaps. And then we want to create individual models based on those multiple window size and multiple overlaps. And we want to ensemble those individual models together. Uh, and uh, like we want to train an ensemble of those individual models. So assume that you have a particular window size W1 and, and the label of that window is uh, this represented by this yellow part. Then again, you have another window size W2 and the label is also represented by the yellow part. You have to make sure that the label on which you're evaluating your individual models are the same. So this is the ensembling like, you know, fusion that you have to do here. You cannot like evaluate uh, different models on different levels and make an ensemble of them. So maybe one of the model is evaluated on running. The other model is being evaluated on walking and you are ensembling the predictions of running and walking that will not work. You have to make sure that you are essentially evaluating on the same level, even when you are using different window sizes. So this W1, W2 and W3 different like, you know, window sizes, you train three different models. And finally, you uh, kind of average out all the predictions that are occurring on this level. And that is your uh, ensembling technique that you use. And this is what this is this our, our method is essentially composed of these two parts. And uh, yeah, this is an old diagram there. I have to I, 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 I do not need actually this part of the diagram for the method. And essentially, it is composed of two parts. The first part is data extraction, where you create this multiple time series data sets in the method that I have shown here. This is the method when you create multiple data, data sets. And this is uh, based on the selection of window and the overlap parameters. And you feed these data sets into individual models. Uh, this is the second part of our uh, method. And finally, you uh, average out the output of each of the models to uh, produce your prediction. You just have to make sure that when you are averaging out your model for your prediction, you are essentially predicting the same level. That's the only consideration that you have to uh, like think of. And that is, uh, that is actually represented by this diagram. So uh, now coming to the, uh, the, the question of why this method works. So the first question is why we select time varying records. So this is all this I already told you that it has been empirically shown that time is uh, like this time frame is very important. The way time window size is very important and uh, it allows us to explore higher order dependencies when we select multiple time windows instead of a single one. It allows us to explore higher order dependencies in the time series. Maybe uh, a time series of 10 seconds indicates that you are running, but if you probably extend it to 20, 20 seconds, you, you can understand that you are uh, like running as well as like some part of the data is about working. So having this, uh, like, you know, uh, having this dependence is quite important. And when we have multiple time varying record, it allows us to explore this dependency. Uh, furthermore, we can capture the uncertainty trend across different time windows. That's the same example that I gave you. Maybe for the first instance, you were quite certain that you were running. For the second instance of 20 seconds of time, you are probably like, you know, 80% certain that you are walking and 20% certain that you are running. And in this case, when you combine the two predictions, then you automatically incorporate certain amount of uncertainty that helps you reduce your overconfidence of the model. And furthermore, uh, finally, you have much broadened exploration capacity in a single Time window size, you explore only one set of the data. When you have a multiple, like, you know, uh, in multiple time windows, you explore more amount of data more efficiently. So that's why we uh, use time varying records. And the second part is why we use the ensembling. So first of all, the averaging process gets rid of uncertainty introduced by hyperparameters of the model. And um, this averaging process is also equivalent to Bayesian model averaging. And hence it also helps you incorporate the uncertainty that is present in the data itself. So it promotes the good uncertainty, the coherent uncertainty, and it helps us get rid of the uh, model uncertainty or the hyperparameter induced uncertainty. And finally, I also have discussed earlier that ensembling helps you uh, boost classification and improve calibration by redoing the variance of the predictions of the output. And this has been uh, shown for some like, you know, so this, this is uh, the, the reference for the variance paper and the boost classification is an old uh, Bishop book. And uh, hence all this taken together, it soft, softens or reduces the softmax, uh, like overconfident softmax at the output of the neural network. So that's why we choose to use ensembles. And finally, prediction conformity is also obtained. So if uh, five models, out of five models, four things you are running and one thinks you are working, then probably you will go with the running one. 
so there is a voting procedure as well which helps you boost your uh, like you know confidence about your activity that you are performing but there are certain caveats uh, that comes with ensembling so for ensembling it is always expected that you, you you are using good models if you are using bad models that perform very like you know bad in classification tasks then automatically your confidence will be like pulled down to a much greater extent more than required and hence it will like you know suffer from bad classification accuracy also you cannot say the model is calibrated because uh, even if you are confident that you are running your ensemble with a bad model would pull it down towards like you know lesser confidence areas which is not even good and uh, also computation time increases uh, like you know subsequently due to the ensemble method so an overview in overview this is what is happening so you have sensor you extract different time steps from the time series of the sensor and based on these time steps you train different models and you finally average the softmax output of those models and uh, give your prediction and, and generate your prediction so this is the ensemble uh, deep time ensemble is all about now i'll quickly go through some of the uh, results for like you know data sets and architectures i have decided to evaluate on four public data sets wisdom uci pamap2 and skoda so wisdom consist of wisdom and uci both consist of motion activity and static activities and by motion activity it composes of walking running jogging sitting and standing both of them so there are six classes in pamap2 you have a range of different sporting motion activities in a, in top of the activities that i already mentioned so it's a much wider data set and finally i have decided to choose another data set from a completely different uh, like you know domain to uh, show the effectivity of our method which is called skoda and this is actually multiple sensor recorded data oh by the way uh, like pamap2 and skoda both has like a lot of sensors in uci and wisdom you only have like you know uh, here you have accelerometer here you have accelerometer plus gyroscope here you have accelerometer plus gyroscope plus magnetometer from different parts of your body and in skoda you have like a whole suite of uh, like you know sensors in your body but this uh, activities that are involved in skoda data set are coming from someone who is assembling like you know parts in a car factory so it's quite varied range of data sets that we have chosen for evaluating our method and since deep time ensembles i did not mention as you but you already have already uh, like you know understood the deep time ensembles is essentially a training method which can be applied to any neural network architecture hence we have decided to choose lstm which is a popular method for time series classification cnn which is again very popular for time series classification and a relatively newer architecture which is called convolutional lstm uh, we decided to test this on three different architectures the convolutional lstm is essentially applied on skoda data set because it produces a state of the art result in uh, that per that perspective now uh, the classification of our f1 average f1 score for uci data set shows us that uh, in using deep time ensemble we boost the classification accuracy by at least 0.3 or 0.4 which is not bad i would say in this time i am still uh, like you know there is some changes in the results so i have to i did not update it yet here in pamf2 i have got like with respect to one of the state of the art papers i have got an increase in the classification f1 score with the deep time ensembles and in skoda that using the convolutional lstm i got like you know an improvement which is very slight but this can also change because i ran this model only once because it's a very like you know big model for running the uh, the deep time ensemble it takes like more than 8 hours because it's a, a quite intensive computation so i have to run a couple of more experiments to verify the results on the skoda dataset as well but generally the trend is uh, like you know positive i would say in terms of classification uh, scores now as i introduced earlier the calibration uh, like you know the, me the mechanism to understand or the number to understand calibration is called expected calibration error so lower is better like you know when we have a lower calibration error that's better that means our model is well calibrated so here and and um, by the way yeah i did not mention this but there is one popular method for uh, let's say calibrating your models which is called temperature scaling and uh, i have compared our ensemble method and and the temperature scaling can be applied on top of any neural network architecture so i have four different comparisons the standard state of the art model the state of the art model plus temperature scaling our method deep time ensembles and deep time ensembles plus temperature scaling and uh, as we see across most of the data sets 
DP plus temperature scaling performs like you know consistently uh, better mostly in some respect deep time ensembles performs like you know better than temperature scaling taken there as well but there is certain like you know uh, um, there are some considerations that 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 we have to take care of and that I will show you in the next slide and my general conclusion is that we should not do temperature scaling with DT, even though it reduces, like you know, um, the it it reduces the expected calibration error. And the reason is that we get uh, very marginal improvements. And doing the temperature scaling requires tweaking of a hyperparameter called, uh, like you know, temperature, which is uh, or initializing a hyperparameter which is called temperature, as as the name suggests, and a wrong tweaking of the temperature can lead to a like you know worsened score as we see in this example so here we see like we have in increased our uh, like you know score to 5 even though um, we we were we are doing better with just the deep time ensemble so this 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 is the reason why i will i would suggest like you know my general suggestion would be to just use ensembling for uh, calibration and accuracy boosting and not apply temperature scaling on top of that. Now coming to some of the diagrams, uh, I, will, uh, I will explain what's happening here. This is quite similar to the reliability diagram that I showed before. So it's just like, you know, reversed. So on the bottom now we have uh, the histogram of the number of samples or the number of uh, the bins that, that falls, uh, like, you know, in each of the bins. So for example, here, uh, this represents that majority of our classific, like the test examples, it falls in this last bin, which is 0.9 to 1. We have divided it into 10 bins and majority of the examples fall, falls in the bin of 0.9 to 1. And this is also, that's why this bin has like a much higher, like, you know, red, red color as compared to rest of the bins. And this represents the gap between this, this, uh, whatever you see, like the black bar represents the accuracy of the bin. And I, this represents the gap between the accuracy and the confidence. So I, in an ideal case, everything should have just be a straight line on the, in this 45 degree line. So it should be almost like there should not be any gap between this accuracy and the confidence. And it should reside like, you know, like this on the 45 degree line. But as we see that that is not the case. Uh, now we have for a range of different architectures, like we have the standard architecture, then we do temperature scaling on that standard architecture. On this right, we have the deep time ensemble version of the architecture, like CNN. And uh, then after doing temperature scaling on the DT, so this is the general, like, you know, formulation for this understanding this diagram. As we can see that in this first model, um, we have an average confidence and average accuracy, which is lying close together, almost close together, sorry. But uh, we still exhibit a uh, expected calibration error of 4% because there is a gap in the average accuracy and the average confidence in the last bin. And there are many examples which are lying in this bin. So if you take a weighted average of the difference between the average accuracy and the average confidence, uh, you, will, you will find this EC score of 4.05. Now, after doing temperature scaling, we have reduced our uh, like an expected calibration error substantially to 2.84. And we see that there is the gap is almost non-existent. So in our highest bin, where most of the examples are concentrated, we are almost like you know very. We have almost closed down the gap between the average confidence and the and the accuracy. So temperature scaling definitely um, works like you know to uh, for, for towards the calibration. Furthermore, here we see this dotted line represents the average confidence, and the black solid line represents the accuracy. So we see our Average confidence lies on the higher side as compared to the accuracy. This means that you are still producing very slight overconfident wrong estimates. Although this is almost like you know not really worth considering, but still you are producing almost like you know a little bit more average confidence than accuracy. After doing temperature scaling, uh, the role is kind of reversed. So you are shifting down your you are pulling down your softmax output, which reduces your average confidence as well. And hence you are like, you know, now making not overconfident predictions, but slightly underconfident predictions. However, the, this is just a visual representation in terms of the metric we are improving upon from 4% to we are improving to 2%. So there is like a certain improvement in the, in the reliability diagram with temperature scaling on the standard convolutional architecture. Now what happens in our deep time ensembles? In deep time ensembles, without any temperature scaling, 
we achieve an expected calibration error of 2.77, which is like, you know, very nice. Plus we have the added advantage on top of it that we get a better classification accuracy as well. Similarly, we can, we can actually add a temperature scaling on that, which reduces like, you know, the, which reduces the, which reduces the confidence uh, estimate, like, you know, which reduces the calibration error even better. And we exhibit even lesser or almost no gap at the highest bin. But this is like a dicey area. You can either choose to do it or you cannot, may not do it. It depends upon your like, you know, preference, but just want to show that doing deep time ensemble also reduces your uh, calibration uh, error like efficiently. And, and the improvement between the deep time ensemble is and the temperature scaled version of deep time ensemble is just 0.3. We exhibit similar like, you know, nature for, for uh, the LSTM architectures as well. We see that for, with temperature scaling, we reduce the LSTM architectures like very uh, marginally, but with deep time ensemble, we reduce it to a great extent, like, you know, from 4% to 1%, which is considered quite a good number in this uh, domain. And if we like introduce temperature scaling, we even scale it down further, the deep time ensembles. We exhibit similar nature, like in the results for the PAMAC2 dataset as well. Here, the calibration error is even higher and we are like, you know, reside, we are substantially reducing the calibration error in deep time ensembles without temperature scaling. Now coming here, the, this is the problem that I was like, you know, saying. So using temperature scaling, the temperature scaling actually made this predictions like, you know, from overconfident to underconfident. So it somehow was well, like, you know, missed the perfect balance between the accuracy and the confidence. And it uh, shifted the average confidence from the right hand side to a far left, uh, like, you know, in the diagram. And this uh, improved, like, you know, this increased, not improved, but rather increased the calibration error, the overall calibration error even though the highest bin is like, you know, uh, let's say even the highest bin, even though the highest bin represents like much lesser gap as compared to the, uh, uh, to the, the normal deep time ensemble. But since it missed out the mark where the accuracy and the confidence should be like, you know, lying close together and made the examples underconfident, the overall calibration error also increased in this uh, like architecture of DTE with temperature scaling for, for this particular data set. So this is like, you know, and, and I believe I was able to manage this particular, uh, like, you know, phenomena by initializing a different uh, temperature. But the problem is that I, uh, uh, like, that can, that can, like, it is dependent upon the, the choice of this uh, temperature, initial temperature. If you, if you choose it, like, you know, nicely, or if you choose it, let's say perfectly, then you will have a perfect calibration. But if you do not manage to choose this perfectly, then you might, uh, like increase your calibration error substantially at the cost of being underconfident. So, I mean, uh, the results uh, I am showing here from these two data sets because uh, for the rest of the data sets, I have to integrate the, the diagrams yet from the implementational code. But uh, generally, the, um, like I think the results are encouraging towards the fact that in deep time ensembles, you calibrate your let's say less calibrated neural network and you also boost your accuracy. So these were the two fundamental propositions and this is kind of satisfying that. Um, I will extend to the new, new couple of data sets that, not new data sets, but certain uh, data sets that I've already chosen. And I will like, you know, have compare it with, let's say other standard ensembles where instead of deep time ensemble, I will simply ensemble the, the existing model and see how it performs in comparison to that. I will also post the confusion matrix when I, like you know, write the paper and uh, the SOTAs for classification, the state of the art, although I have, uh, have included some of the state of the art, but there are certain confusions which I would probably discuss once we start the questions about the state of the art. And uh, this will be generic questions. And uh, the, these are the things that I have to integrate in the results. In terms of future work, uh, I think once uh, this, if this work gets accepted at some place, uh, then, we can talk about, think about distilling the ensemble models so that we can get rid of the computational inefficiency that are coming out of that. We can also explore <clears throat> confidence calibrated loss functions, which I was discussing with Sarunas the other day. And we can expand across some data sets and integrate uncertainty factor by talking about out of distribution and in distribution examples, which I was, uh, which I started earlier, uh, like, you know, this in the year. So uh, with that, I would like to, um,
thank you and uh, that's the end of my presentation so if you have any questions comments and like you know feedbacks so that would be great for me and if you of course did not understand anything please like let me know thank you thank you very much deba for the interesting presentation so any of the participants uh, have any questions um, I would like to raise a question for Deba. Yeah, if that's okay. Perfect. Um, first, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, I wanted to, I noticed, let's say, you using an sampling method, and I, I thought immediately uh, that, well, when we do time series analysis, most likely you've noticed it in your data sets as well, that there are a lot of missing values, most likely, uh, like at least in the data sets that I'm working with, we have a lot. And so in that sense, choosing a window size is even more important because uh, I mean, different window sizes can give different results depending on like the missing values and where they stand. So I was thinking that potentially your method could also alleviate, let's say, some of the problems introduced by missing values and that it could be interesting Interesting to explore whether this ensembling method also maybe alleviates um, some of these missing value issues for uh, data sets that have higher missing values. So it, it might be interesting to check as well, something like that. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if it would be, let's say, positive. But uh -huh. I think we can for definitely that's worth exploring. So uh, let me let me try to like, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, if I understood the problem, uh, like, you know, that you are have, you're discussing that you have a time series and let's say for one of these windows, you have certain uh, like missing values, which affect the in performance of an individual model. But instead, if we have an ensemble of different window sizes that are being evaluated on the same example, then maybe in one of couple of the windows, we avoid the problem of the missing value and train like a good model successfully. And then when we ensemble it with the bad model together, we can actually alleviate the uh, the performance of the bad model by a sufficient number because of the let's say classification improvement that comes from the good models yes exactly i was thinking that maybe that could be the case in some data sets let's yeah, say yeah absolutely uh, it, it's something worth exploring maybe in a, like after your first publication as an extension mm -hmm. so i thought it could be maybe that's, that's useful. Great. I would maybe uh, discuss more with you about like which data sets you use and uh, like you know the exact problems of uh, those data sets. Yes, of course. Cool. Um, and then a second question that I had is like um, you've mentioned, of course, like ensembling as well as uh, ensembling based on different window sizes. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is. Were there approaches that were doing the same thing before? So ensembling with models of different that utilize different window sizes, or is this uh, the first approach? And if there existed, let's say, similar models before, how is your model um, different or better in that extent, let's say? Uh, okay, so to the best of my knowledge, there has been some models uh, with ensembles, but not with ensembling different window sizes. So for example, the ensembles that I have seen in the domain of activity recognition, they usually are involved with selection of different, let's say, uh, hyperparameters, um, selection of, like, you know, certain different architectures of neural network models, and they are ensembling those architectures together and trying to find the, like, you know, the right balance to improve the classification accuracy. But I think uh, the novelty here lies in the fact that you have to, you have to ensemble based on this mechanism which ensures that each time your, your model is essentially being evaluated. When you're averaging the ensembles of your model, you're averaging on the same example, but uh, like, you know, with a varying window size. So that's the novelty that comes uh, with this model. And I think uh, so far as per my literature review goes, I have not seen this uh, method yet. Um, thank you. That's a great idea, actually. Um, so good work. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Deba, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And thanks everyone uh, for uh, participating in this sixth race online seminar. Uh, this time in two weeks, uh, we will meet again for the seventh uh, race online seminar of 2021.